return for a moment to John Brilliant's chapter, just briefly. I'd like to just review some of the points made already in the week in regard to the experience of Peter on this occasion. And you recall how that when Christ came to, to, his, to wash his feet, he said, No, you will never wash my feet. And Peter thought that he had enough support at that point of time to ensure that Christ would have to change, would have to, in fact, uh, yield his idealism for something more practical and more realistic. Because while Peter could, could admire the single-mindedness of Jesus Christ in regard to the Jews and the Messiah's kingdom, he thought it was too idealistic, too wonderful to be a working order or organization. And uh, he thought that with the backing of the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and his father, the sovereign of the people, he could, he could certainly bring enough pressure to bear to bring about a change in Christ's attitude at last. Christ would be forced to yield to his way. But I appreciate the inflexibility of Jesus Christ who said, except I wash your feet, you have no part of me at all, none at all. Christ was quite inflexible, quite unmoved, quite unchangeable in the face of the apostle or of the disciple Peter. Now, it's this confidence which Christ showed at this point, which to dwell upon this Lord's Supper service this morning. Because Christ uh, took this stand and maintained that stand at, at the darkest possible hour of his whole life experience so far. The next day is to be crucified as a malefactor between two thieves, to be spat upon, to be really ridiculed and, and rejected by the majority. And the future of the king, the future of the kingdom looked anything but bright at that point in time. It looked very dark, very dismal, very much a failure. And I find too, sometimes we look to the future and it doesn't look very, very uh, promising at all. The text over from the Desire of Ages at this point, which has been a great treasure to me lately, it comes in the chapter called the Transfiguration when Christ prayed the mountain top to. Uh, be prepared for the coming uh, sorrow before him. And he went, went up the mountain with three disciples to pray for many, many long hours to gain fresh comfort and assurance from his father. Mm. Always find his chapter hard to find. Yes. Page 420 in the book Desire of Ages. And the statement reads, he must himself gain a fresh hold on omnipotence, for only thus can he contemplate the future. At those words, he must himself gain a fresh hold on omnipotence, for only thus can he contemplate the future. In other words, to regain his grip on the future and his confidence that he could successfully meet the battles to come, he had to gain a fresh grip on omnipotence. And sometimes we find that as we look at the dark and dismal future and the dark and dismal present, we wonder if God's promises can ever be fulfilled and we'd like to see them fulfilled and, and, and as they're promised. I thought this point we'd spend a little while looking at Joel, the second chapter, and uh, refreshing our souls with the glorious promises of God in regard to what our future is, namely victory and triumph and final consummation of all things and the finishing of the mystery of God. In the book of Joel, which is quite familiar to us, I'm sure, we find the first chapter devoted to the wasting of the church of God through false doctrines and teachings and a great apostasy. And uh, that condition, of course, has certainly been attained so far as the Adventist Church of today is concerned. And it talks of poverty, it talks of wasting, it talks of decay, it talks of darkness and death, and uh, it's a very sad and sorry picture. And chapter 2 opened with the, with, the, with the call to blow the trumpet in Zion, to stand the alarm on my holy mountain, to awaken the people to realisation of their desperate need and to rend their hearts, not their garments, and make great preparation for what is coming in the near future. That we know, I shan't take time to detail every, every word of it this morning, chapter 2. Let's go into verse 18, shall we, of chapter 2. And in response to our meeting, the conditions laid down in, chapter, in the earlier part of chapter 2, the Lord says, so I read it please, verse 18. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. Right, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. What is the land? is Palestine, the prominent, or Can I should say Canaan is a better name to call it. And what does that land symbolize? The church, okay, Zion or the church. 
Now, then the Lord will be zealous for his land, which seems to indicate a change on God's part from not being zealous to being zealous, right? <coughs> does that seem to be indicated? But does God change? No. So the matter of zeal then is something which is apparent and not real. In other words, God's zeal is just as strong today as it will be then, but it will break through to our situation where we will see God's zeal as different from his apparent indifference at the present time. At least some folks think he's, 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 he's indifferent right now. So God's zeal will break through and he will be, uh, be manifest. Now, think of the experience of Christ when he was upon us and there was, a, there was a time when he was very zealous or apparently very zealous for his church. Remember when, that, when it was? The zeal of my house has eaten me up. Was quoted in, in describing it? Right, the cleansing of the temple. Now, was Christ more zealous then than any other time for his temple? No, he wasn't, but he was more actively so and broke through the barriers that kept him back previously. So here's the promise that God will be zealous for his land and pity his people. Now, read verse 19, please. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you again and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied with it. no longer make you reproach for the Right. So God says, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I no longer make you reproach among the nations. What do these three things symbolize? Grain and new wine and oil. What is the grain? It's wheat. And from what is wheat? From what, what is made from wheat? Bread. What's the bread symbolize? Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life, right? In other words, spiritual food is promised to us at this point in time. I'll send you spiritual food, which is the grain, and new wine, which is what? What's the wine symbolize? The life of Christ, right? Life. In the Lord's Supper, we find that bread and wine are used to symbolize the body and blood of Jesus Christ. The life of the flesh is in the blood. The wine symbolizes the new life in the place of the old. And oil, what's the oil obviously symbolize? The Holy Spirit. So here's the promise then that God will send to us uh, spiritual nourishment, spiritual life, and the Holy Spirit, and we shall be satisfied therewith. Uh, when we think of the power and the might in that provision, we certainly shall be mightily satisfied when the time comes. We rejoice in God's glorious provisions for us at that time. And this service shall no longer be a reproach among the nations. At the present time, we are a very small and a very despised company of people worldwide. Scattered here and there, one here, another there, and many places, nothing at all. And so far as the Adventist Church is concerned, how do we rate? Not even worth consideration. Just below, below, below even consideration. And as far as the Protestant Church is concerned, how do we rate? We don't, we don't even exist. <laughs> and the Catholic Church? Likewise, and the world, likewise, we are in fact a reproach among the nation because of, well, if they know us as our efforts, could be reproached because of, of their past history. But that's going to change, and uh, we shall become a force to be reckoned with under the ministration of the almighty power of the Spirit. <coughs> now, compare this with after, after, after the crucifixion. How did the disciples rate in the Jewish view after Christ died and was raised and went back to heaven again? Had they right? Something to be reckoned with. A failure, right? Not, not to be reckoned with, just something to be ignored and uh, not even considered. It's only apparent. Apparent, right. But when the Spirit came upon the mighty power, what did, what did the leaders then say? You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and became a great concern to the Jewish leadership. So, and so, of course, they became the obvious of persecution of the length and breadth of the entire Roman Empire and were scattered in every nation kindred tongue and people at that time. Now when this change takes place in our experience we become a force to be reckoned with, it will also again generate mighty persecutions and we'll, we'll find a very tough and terrible time, the darkest now of whole history. So the next verse now shall we, which is verse uh, 20. I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive them away into a barren and desolate land with its face toward the eastern sea and its back toward the western sea. Now, I, I love the promise contained herein because the Northern Army refers to what awesome power. 
Babylon, right? He is the king of the north, the counter the false king of the north, the real one, of course, is Jesus Christ. And here's the problem where, where those are, are new, far from you, the northern army. It would be taken a long way away from us. There be no close face-to-face confrontation. We do into a barren, desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and back toward the western sea. So, so they're great enemies to be contained and uh, repulsed and driven away from us at this point of time. Now, let's take verse 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice. The Lord has done a marvelous thing. Right, fear not, O land, don't be afraid, dear church, be glad and rejoice, the Lord has done marvelous things. You know, I remember when um, the message first came to me and I was separated from the King of the North, at least in part back in 1953. And I saw that in myself I was a different person altogether. I found myself saying, it's the Lord's doing, it's marvellous in my eyes. I had the same experience. You wonder at what God has done. It's a marvel and a wonder in your very soul. But what took place back there, of course, about the beginning of the mighty thing God's yet to do. And as, as the text says, be glad and rejoice, O land. I get the words exactly right, it's not quite the right order. Fear, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, the Lord has done marvellous things. Now let's read the end of verse 24, 23, 24, 22, 23, and 24. Do not be afraid, the beasts of the field, and the open pastures are springing up. The tree bears its fruit. The big tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad, then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, who has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The fresh, fresh and floors shall be full of wheat. The vats shall overflow with your wine and oil. Thank you. Now, what a glorious promise that contained in those several verses we just read. We call it, we which call, cause must be glad and rejoice, for he's given us the former rain moderately, and now he'll give us the latter rain in full strength. In consequence, of course, the thrashing floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So here's a picture of, of a sheer abundance of all those wonderful things we need so badly bread of life, the truth of God, the uh, new wine, which is the life of Jesus Christ, and the oil, which is the Holy Spirit. Now, I greatly appreciate the promises contained in verses 25 to 27. So I will restore to you the years and the swarming locust as you, crawling locust, and consuming locust, and chewing locust, and my great army, which I sent to my enemies. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied with the praise of the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Hmm. The word restore means to give back that which was lost, does it not? It's restoration, rebuilding, uh, the giving back of something of which you've been deprived. And we're told that we're giving back what the years have taken from us through the swarming locust, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, of the old King James translation, the canker worm, the palmer worm, the caterpillar, and the locust. Now, I do see in this, I hope I'm not wrong, a promise of the restoration of what was lost because of our not being given the blessing of child salvation from our earliest moments. As we made clear in the book entitled Child Salvation, sin is a destroyer, and wherever sin is present, it destroys. So during the years that sin reigned in our mortal bodies before we were even born, a work of destruction went forward, which continued, continued until we finally became born again Christian, we were stopped in its tracks, and, and we moved in the opposite direction. But uh, the deep privation that we suffered because of those years of being the host for the body of sin in us uh, has left us seriously impaired. Now, in the life of Jesus Christ, of course, and Daniel and Jeremiah and even John the Baptist, we see what we could have been in lives unimpaired by the presence of sin from our conception. Now, this tells me that uh, when we come to the latter rain period and the mighty hour, when the Spirit takes place, there will be a work of regeneration take place. And it's, it's restored to us what has been taken from us during those long years when sin reigned in our mortal bodies. That is an accompanying problem prospect. It's a wonderful prospect, to say the least of it. This is there's another reason why those of us who are adults need to confess and repent over the child salvation message and our failures to do it right to ignorance in the first case. So what uh, 
if my conclusion is correct, and I do believe they are, they want a mighty army of super powerful people God is going to have during the loud cry period. Because Jesus is a, is a picture of what, uh, a, what we, we all would be if we had if we had like him been born again from our conception, right? He's a picture of that. Now when you consider what he achieved in three and a half years alone, what would be achieved by a thousand or two thousand or three thousand people all, all with the same power which he had, going forth in mighty strength to do God's will in his own way. So we find that uh, once we've been given back this restoration and we shall eat, eat and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and so on. You shall never be put to shame. Now comes the outpouring of the Spirit in verse 28 down to verse 32, please. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my Spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood, and fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood coming to the great awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said among the remnant the Lord calls. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Here is a picture then of the prophetic gift being experienced by old men and young men, by maid servants and men servants. They shall see visions and dreams and shall have direct communication with heaven as it was given the prophets in the Old Testament. Now, without question, a very glorious picture is painted in these verses, right? A wonderful picture of our future. A future which is not too far distant because time is running out and God must certainly bring the loud cry in the very, very near future to his people. <coughs> when that time comes, we, we will learn then what these verses really mean. We read them now, but we don't fully see and understand the full power and input that is, oh, I shouldn't say input, the full power and potential that's contained in these words. Just imagine uh, what it'll be like when we're fully occupied in preaching the gospel, gospel to large crowds of listeners who will respond in some cases for, for the better, in some cases for the worse. The power to heal the sick, the power to speak in tongues, the power to witness for God we've never done before. That will give us full satisfaction and full joy and full, full, full blessing. So let's, to, let's today encourage ourselves with these prospects that when they come we shall be blessed by them and, and we shall at last see the fruition of our preparation and our work along the way. Now, in order to achieve it, of course, the work of preparation to be accomplished. So let's go back briefly to the 13th chapter of John again to look at the experience of Christ and the disciples there and also to look at this from the book of Desire of Ages to find out in what way we must most diligently prepare for that which is coming upon the earth as a great surprise in the very near future. Now in John chapter 13 we find that Jesus Christ came to wash their feet from the, from the dust upon them and this symbolises the work of reformation or the success of washing which succeed the new birth experience. Page 646 in Desire of Ages if you have the book please. Page 646. And uh, we find these men came together with a spirit of ambition, a spirit of self-exaltation, a spirit of blindness, a spirit of determination to be the first in the kingdom. And that while that spirit was in them, they could not enter into fellowship with Jesus Christ, who sat there separate from them in the early part of the meal. Now, likewise, Sister White says here, on the bottom of the page, someone read please, like, Peter and his brethren. Like Peter and his brethren, we too have been washed in the blood of Christ. Yet often through contact with evil, the heart's purity is soiled. We must come to Christ for his cleansing grace. Peter shrank from bringing his soiled feet in contact with the hands of his Lord and Master. But how often we bring our sinful, deluded heart in contact with the heart of Christ. How grievous to him is our evil temper, how vanity and our vanity and pride. Yet all our infirm all our infirmity and defilement we must bring to him. He alone can wash us clean. We are not prepared for communion with him unless cleansed by his uh, efficient. 
efficacy. Efficacy. We've, right. We've been to his efficiency or his effectiveness, right? Now, at this point in our study period, this point, we need to begin to do some very, very close self-examination. <coughs> we come to be blessed today. We want to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in large or small measures. God sees fit. But this can t only take place if the way is, is prepared for his coming. Therefore, we all must very carefully examine our hearts, search them very deeply and thoroughly, to find this is present in us any spirit of pride, ambition, selfishness, jealousy, anger, a carelessness, indifference, unbelief, or anything we've done wrong to our day which needs to be created and taken care of. Let's search our hearts right now as I'm, as I'm speaking. And as we find these things, let's place them upon the altar of sacrifice, and we finish with them and take into ourselves the opposite number of the divine grace of God. Now the principle is this, of course, that first comes the cleansing and then comes the infilling. First the eradication and then the implantation. Coming back to page 646 in Desire of Age, we find that um, this is precisely the work which Jesus Christ uh, did on that occasion. Let's pick it up in the middle of the paragraph. Well, let's pick it up. I think with the, with the paragraph which starts, these words mean more than bodily cleanliness. Page 646. Somebody got it? These words mean more than bodily cleanliness. Christ is still speaking of the higher cleansing as illustrated by the lower. He who came from the bath was clean, but the sandal feet soon became dusty and again needed to be washed. So Peter and his brethren had been washed in the great tops, open for sin and uncleanness. Christ acknowledged them as his, but temptation had led them into evil, and they still needed his cleansing grace. When Jesus girded himself with a towel to wash the dust from their feet, he desired by that very act to wash the alienation, jealousy, and pride from their hearts. This was of far more consequence than the washing of their dust. With the spirit they had then had, not one of them was prepared for communion with Christ brought into a state of humility and love, they were not prepared to partake of the household supper or to share in the memorial service which Christ was about to institute. Their hearts must be cleansed. Pride and self-seeking create dissension and hatred, but all this Jesus washed away in washing their feet. 